Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the Buddhist podcast in the dunya. You joined back with the three main hosts, the three Muslims, Fai, Rami, Anghel. And we got a special guest today. Some of you may know him, some of you may not. Beautiful brother, Abu Taymiya. How are you, bro? How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah, really good. Alhamdulillah, bro. It's, it's such an honor. I already said it before the, we even started the podcast, but it's such an honor to have you here. You know what you're doing for the Ummah, bro. And may Allah, may Allah recognize it. May Allah put barakah on it. And may Allah bless you for it. 100%. Amen. Amen, bro. Amen. Whatever you guys well, see, you know, like it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we wouldn't be able to, you know, pick up our fingers. If it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We always make this dua after salah. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Oh Allah, aid and assist us in remembering you, you know, being thankful to you and perfecting our acts of worship. So whatever you guys see in the World Wide Web, you know, we have to attribute it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's still not as much as we want. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it easy for us to you know, really get down to proper business, you know? Inshallah mm-hmm. ta'ala. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. Do you have the transliteration of that? Of the hadith? No, would you just the dua? Uh, the dua. Yeah, Allahumma, oh Allah, a'inna ala dhikrik, aid and assist us in remembering you, right? Uh, yeah. Wa shukrik, also being thankful towards you and uh, perfecting our acts of worship. Yeah, yeah. mashallah. That's that's a translation. I was, I was saying the uh, transliteration. Like, bro, you know, I'll, I'll have them, I'll have have them have, to us. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm asking because I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a revert, so my Arabic is not. It's not very fluent, so I want to be able to like, you know, read it. Uh, inshallah, bro. After inshallah, the stream, I would love that. I would and love it, bro. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi taught Mu'ad in the Jabal, the great companion, to read this after every salah. SubhanAllah. Mm. He told him, I love you for the sake of Allah. Inni uhibbuka ya Mu'ad. Right? Indeed, I love you, O Mu'ad. I say this to you, ya uh, Angu, huh? I'm an angel, huh? Uh, indeed, indeed, I love you for the sake of Allah. You know, uh, do not leave a single prayer except after reading this dua. Every time mm-hmm. when you finish the salah, recite this dua. Just as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the companion, I'm not sharing it with you, you know. Inshallah. Inshallah, bro. Alhamdulillah. Man, so with that being said, with that being said, we were talking about this before. I had to bring it up because I completely forgot. But high value men and high value women in Islam, in light of the Quran and the Sunnah, bro, the floor is yours by all means. Does Rami want to say anything? Yeah, do you guys want to say anything before I start speaking? Because I think, I, think, I, think, I think me and Rami are definitely in to listen mm-hmm. and gain some hikmah, bro, inshallah. Yeah. I, I would like to just preface by saying what a lot of people think a high value man or woman is nowadays, just so we can really compare and contrast to what people think matters and what actually matters. So high value men and women, that's a term you hear a lot in red pill, um, which has unfortunately become more of a dean nowadays. It's become more of like an ideology where people will literally have a question. Oh, you know, my my wife is acting like this. My girl girlfriend is acting like this. What should I do? They'll go to some YouTuber online and like kind of take him like a prophet and have him answer and say, oh, just play these kind of games with her. A high value man in this kind of world is someone who makes a lot of money, who has a lot of fame and fortune. He gets all the girls he wants. And that's what they identify a high value man with. Now, keep that in mind when Sheikh goes in on what a high value man really is in light of the Quran and Sunnah. And a high value woman to them is actually even worse. It's purely someone who is attractive and will like obey you and listen to you. That's what they'll see a high value woman as someone who will be loyal to you, which is a good trait, loyalty. But it's someone who is attractive and basically nothing more. So, Sheikh, why don't you please educate us on what high value really is Islamically? Mm-hmm. طيب الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه والسراج المنيرة. I think maybe a good place to start is that we establish and highlight that what really matters at the end of the day 
is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks of every single one of us. You can be an individual who is considered high value amongst all of the creation that are walking on the face of this earth. However, if you are a saqib, if you are somebody who you know, is absolutely garbage, if you want to call it that, right? In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does that really, really matter? Right? SubhanAllah, right? When you even look at this, you know, it's, it's such a profound hadith. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man intamasa rida nasi li sakhatillah sakhita allahu anhu wa asqata anhu nafs Whoever looks for the pleasure of others, SubhanAllah, he does things, right, in order to please so-and-so, to get into the good books of so-and-so, this person and that person, his main concern is what the people think. And in the process of doing so, brothers and sisters who are listening, right, he enrages Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He enrages and angers Allah azza wa with his actions. What did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say is going to happen? What will the outcome be? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will become angry with him and he will make the people angry with him as well. Right? So at the end of the day, that which really, really matters is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks of every single one of us. And that which is going to make you praiseworthy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to simply fulfill what he has instructed every single one of us. Right? SubhanAllah, you know, I came across the statement of Ibn Jawzi and it became one of my favorite. He honestly did. Right? He said, Ajibtu liman yatasanna'u nas." It amazes me how one really goes out his way to please the people, to get into their good books. He forgets that all of their hearts are in the hands of Allah Azza Meaning, Allah Azza wa can easily change the state of their heart of what they think about you. Right? And we know the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, Inna al-qulubu bayna usbu'ayn min asabi arabi al-alameen Indeed, the hearts of the people are in between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa could choose to keep it upright and Allah Azza wa could choose to lead it astray. So it's in the hands of Allah Azza wa Right? So as long as we work towards pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's one of the points that I have written down anyway, right? Uh, you know, إثار الآخرة على الدنيا Prioritizing the hereafter over the dunya, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor you. It doesn't necessarily mean that one has to be known by the people in order to be considered high value in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Mm. I don't know if you guys have heard this statement before. I don't know who actually said it, but the statement goes, how many people are unknown on the earth? Nobody knows who they are, but they are known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? They are known by Allah Azza wa Jal. I always tell brothers and sisters, you just started practicing, right? You're doing a lot of good deeds. You may come across an individual, you may walk past a person who's doing all sorts of sins, and it's so easy that you end up looking down on that person, right? You look down at that person, it could be the reason why you end up falling off. Be extra careful how you look at that individual. You look down at him, you never know, brothers, right? You belittle him, right? He could have a secret deed between him and Allah Azza wa Jal that nobody knows about. He cries his eyes, you know, he, you know, he cries his eyes out every night, begging Allah, forgive me for my shortcomings, I'm trying. And then because of that, he has such a high status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as opposed to you who walked past that individual with arrogance and pride, right? Ma'al-asif is shadeed. So uh, I think this is a good place to maybe start. There's so much more that can be mentioned, right? What really at the end of the day matters, my brothers and my sisters, and this is what's going to raise you in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that you adhere to what he has instructed you with, right? This also reminds me of uh, Abdurrahman Ibn Abza You know it's good that you guys actually mentioned this It just came to mind literally right now And what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu says Really uh, should be written into golden ink One time Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was, uh, was leaving Mecca Right And he reached an area called Usfan Right it's, you know, it's some distance from Mecca And he runs in to a, uh, 
Tabi'i called Nafi' who used to give service to his son Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Nafi' asks the caliphate, the great Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab, who have you left the people in charge of? You're now leaving. Who have you left in charge? He said, an individual called Abdurrahman ibn Abza. He said, who? Abdurrahman ibn Abza. It's not, he's not like a household name, right? You know, he doesn't, subhanAllah, ring a bell. So then he told him, Mawla min Mawalin, he's from the servants that we have. So you place in charge a servant. Imagine now, I think we share the same queen, right? I think you guys are well in America or in Canada? Me and Rami are in Canada. You, you're in Rami in Canada. Okay, and, and, uh, and Angle, you're in a... Am I saying your name right, by the way? His name is pronounced An- Anhel. Anhel. Anhel, yes. Yeah. Uh, like, and you're in America, right? Bro, you muted, bro. <laughs> yeah, right now I'm in France, brother. Oh, you're in France. Okay, mashallah. Yeah. So I think in Canada, we, we both share the same queen, right? We're in the UK, Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Queen. I think in the US, we've got the same queen as well. Wow, and maybe I'm mistaken. But I know in Australia, we've got the same queen. I just came back from Australia now. And uh, we we'll make mention of this from time to time. Anyways. That's like a, an Aussie Abu Tamiya joke. Like, uh, so anyways, going back to the point that I was making, imagine now Queen Elizabeth is leaving. She decides to go off on a holiday and then she places a servant in charge of the people. What would the reaction of the people actually be? This is exactly what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu done. Right? And he says to him, haven't you heard the statement of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises people in accordance to how much they adhere to this Quran. And other people are put down. Other people are put down. Other people are humiliated because of how distant he is from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the point that he was trying to make is, here, Abdurrahman ibn Abza, he has learned the Quran, he has learned the inheritance, so why shouldn't I place him in charge? Look how Allah Azza wa Jal raised this servant in the eyes of Umar ibn Khattab, in the eyes of the creation. And that's only after he had a high status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So if you want izzah, you want to be honored in this world, then simply adhere to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. And inshallah ta'ala you will see a lot of prosperity bi idnillahi ta'ala. Um, so that's just a muqaddim, inshallah ta'ala, somewhere where we can start. Um, hmm. So would you say that this is one of the many traits of a high-value man and woman in Islam? Or would you say that this is the trait, like the only one that's like, mm. of, like truly, truly worth mentioning in terms of a high-value man and woman in Islam? Well, if we look in the uh, Quran and likewise the prophetic sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we find so many different traits, right? That the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself made mention of that Allah Azza wa Jal referred to these men as a rijal. Because there's a difference between a male and a man, even in the Quran, right? You have men and you have those who are dhaka. And the Sharia makes a distinction of that. You've got men and you got males, right? So one of the first characteristics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made mention of when referring to men as actual men, right? In Surah At-Tawbah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He speaks about the hypocrites and how they try their utmost best to cause this unity and this harmony amongst the Muslims. They even tried to build a masjid that was being spearheaded at the time by an individual called Abu Amir al-Munafiq. He was a hypocrite. Right? So anyways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent on the verse, لا تقم فيه أبدا Don't ever, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stand in this type of masjid. لمسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه A masjid that was established upon a taqwa, upon righteousness, upon piety, is foremost that you stand in. Look what then Allah mentioned. And here comes the point that you guys are looking for. There are within this house, this masjid, men. They love to purify themselves. 
Right. right? This is the characteristic, the trait that is being mentioned. They love to purify themselves. What does that actually mean? Are we speaking about purifying your outward self? Now, nah, without a shadow of a doubt, this would also fall under this meaning. No one is saying you should walk around, you should walk around, right? Stinking and uh, and uh, not using scents and perfumes and so on and so forth. This is actually something that is blameworthy, right? Something you walk into the masjid, and then the guy next to you has all you know bio coming out of his armpits. This is actually detrimental. This is not something that is appropriate or praiseworthy, right? In fact, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that one should not come to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal and he just ate onion. Right? This causes harm to the people around you. Likewise, it causes harm to uh, the angels. They find it irritating. What can we also derive from this? That anything that is going to irritate also falls under this. This is referred to in the Sharia as Qiyas, analogy. So if we're here, Talking about you not coming to the house of Allah, you know, with onion in your mouth. Don't come to the house of Allah stinking as well, right? Because this is also something that is going to, right, irritate the believers and likewise the angels, right? So that's also not something that should be disregarded. However, mm-hmm. that which here Allah Azza wa Jal is specifically making mention of, you purifying the heart. And at the end of the day, this is what really matters. This is exactly what you want to talk about, right? Angel, huh? Purification of the heart. He was making mention of that before the uh, the podcast, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the Quran, he quotes Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He who begged Allah, right, the day when you resurrect us, O oh Allah, do not humiliate me. This is Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala not to humiliate him. ولا تخزني يوم يبعثون يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون the day on your wealth, right? And also your children, your kids are not going to be of any benefit to you. The only thing that's going to benefit you, as Allah mentions, and he makes an exemption of this, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except the one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who meets him with a sound heart. What does a sound heart here mean, brothers? Right? A heart that has been cleansed from shirk, innovations, and the sins. And this is what we're working towards. Every single one of us, right, on a day-to-day basis should be worrying about how I can purify this heart. How I can keep it clean from anything that is going to have a detrimental effect on my hereafter. And you have what? Shirk, which is the worst of sins. To associate partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there isn't anything more greater than that. Right? You have innovations introducing newly invented practices into our religion what makes our religion so perfect brothers and sisters is because it's been preserved right it's been preserved our deen has been completed this verse that came down it was a Jew one time that came up to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said there's a verse in your Quran had it come down upon us Jews we would have taken that day as a day of celebration which ayah are you talking about the day when I completed your religion Right? The day when I complete your religion. SubhanAllah, imagine, right? Uh, we just accepted all of these innovative practices into our religion. Would our religion be any different to the Christians? You've got gay pastors now. You've got some of their pastors that are gay. And then he's what? Reading out the Bible to them. Sorry, brothers. It just looks like the lights are coming off here. Oh, and there's nothing dodgy going on here, but... Uh... Someone keeps switching off. Huh? No, no, there you go. You go. Don't worry, the place is gin free. No, I like it. came back on. So it's, I'm, I'm actually in the message in one of the rooms. So uh, the, the point of the matter is, the point of the matter is, uh, I mean, look how their deen, their religion, has become so tampered with. Right? If we open the door now for anyone and everyone to just come and start introducing newly invented practices into our religion, our religion will just become no different to this. Can just be changed, it can be just be tweaked, and so on and so forth. And then the third thing, of course, brothers and sisters, is making sure that our hearts are purified from the sins, whether they may be major, whether they may be minor. This is what we really want to ensure in meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what really matters at the end of the day, because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be looking at. There's another hadith as well, hadith of Bihurayza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when the Messenger said, 
He, Allah Azza wa Jal, does not look at your outer appearance. He doesn't look at how huge or how thin or how skinny you are. No offense to you brothers who work out, huh? Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't actually pay uh, too much focus to that, right? Or what color skin you are or what color skin you have. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're orange, whether you're tanned, all of that, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at that. Right? Allah looks at your hearts and he also looks at your actions. Now that I said that, does that mean I'm, I'm discouraging everybody to uh, work out or to go to the gym? No, I'm not actually saying that. Right? We spend sometimes how many hours in the gym? Eight, nine hours? Uh, mashallah, the brother is so strong. Uh, he can bench press 120 kilos. Right? He's that strong. Allahumma barik. But then, brothers, you know, when it comes to the Fajr prayer, that blanket is only 500 grams. Are we able to lift that? Huh? That's very, very important. That Imagine we just spend a fraction of that on our hearts, on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It'd go a very, very long way. And of course, Islam also encourages one to be strong, to prepare himself. Right? So I'm not disregarding that at all, but I'm saying what really, really matters in the eyes of Allah azza wa jal is the purity of your heart, right? When you really think about it, brothers and sisters, when an individual does these filthy evil acts, would we all agree that they all stem because of some sickness in his heart? Think about it for a moment, guys, right? The individual who starts spewing all this nonsense after having embraced the ideology of atheism, didn't it all start with something that settled in his heart? It started with his heart, and then all of a sudden he started projecting on his limbs. That's the reality of the matter. Likewise, when you look at these feminists, this belief settled in her heart. And then she started spewing all, all of this evil, all of this nonsense that's coming out of her mouth. The whole world, brothers, right, you could see, is run on a belief. China doesn't do whatever it does except due to a belief. America doesn't do what it does except due to a belief. When this heart becomes corrupted, you see that the limbs, they follow suit. Mm. And again, this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. Indeed, inside of your body, there's a piece of flesh. If that becomes rectified, everything else becomes rectified. If that becomes corrupt, everything else will become corrupt as well. What is this? This is the heart. Right? This is the heart. Um, does that make sense, guys? So this is maybe... Uh, the first trait that we can make mention of. You guys want to add anything? You guys want to say anything? Huh? You guys have it makes comments? sense. I huh? don't know. It makes sense. I just want to make it clear to... again. I don't have anything against people who go out and work out. Huh? Someone's listening to this thinking, oh, this guy's telling us not to go to the gym. La, go work out. Huh? Muscle yourself up. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. However, if this is now going to affect your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply because you're around women who are dressed in whatever they are in, dressed with, you know, with all that Thai stuff. This is, of course, without a shadow of a doubt, is it not going to have an impact on your heart? That which you look at, everything that you keep looking at, brothers and sisters, it has a direct impact on an individual's heart. That black dot and then another black dot all the way up until your heart has become so blackened. You put good in front of that individual, he doesn't even recognize it. You just see him drowning in evil. And that is because his heart has become so desensitized to evil and filth. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would repent, brothers and sisters, 70 times in a sitting. 70, and this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And we know that repentance and also saying Astaghfirullah, it cleans the heart. These black dots, every single time, this black dot hits your heart, it's cleaning it when you're saying Astaghfirullah. And in some narrations, he would do it 100 times. Not are we doing istighfar, not are we seeking re repentance from Allah as well as seeking forgiveness, while at the same time we find ourselves in these environments thinking that there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Wallahi, brothers, this will lead us to destruction. Every time when we see whatever we shouldn't be looking at, it is putting that black dot on our, onto our hearts, which then has consequences, some very serious consequences. Imagine, brothers, right? I had... Brothers and sisters message me in the month of Ramadan saying what? I committed zina in the month of Ramadan. Imagine that. In the month of Ramadan, they committed zina. 
How do you think this happened? Let me ask you guys, honestly. Tell me what you think. How do you think they committed zina in the month of Ramadan? And I would even ask them, did you know her or did you know him? Before the month of Ramadan, they would say, no, we didn't know one another. How do you think it happened so quickly in the month of Ramadan? How about this? I'm not sure. Did they know it was zina or did they not know it was zina? No, of course they knew it was zina. They knew no. that they shouldn't be doing zina. But how did it now reach this particular point where they're committing zina in the month of Ramadan, knowing that they shouldn't be doing this in the most sacred The state of months? their hearts. Yeah, it was in the heart. What happened was, brothers, what they kept on looking at on social media, one thing led to another. Mm. Not lowering the gaze, he sees this fancy profile picture, it clicks on her profile. And the moment you click on her profile, brothers and sisters, you are playing with fire. One thing just led to another before they ended up falling into what was the unexpected. An innocent look led to what? A zina. SubhanAllah. He kept on looking and what? Every single time he hits his heart, that black dot hits his heart. And he kept on looking. And you know some brothers say as well, and I think it's worth mentioning, I'm giving da'wah to her. I'm giving da'wah to her. She ends up giving da'wah to him, brother. Huh? She ends up giving da'wah to him. Man, as if it's shadeed. You know? Sorry to say but the heart, brothers and sisters, is something that, you know, should really be given a lot of concern to. At times, you're feeling down. Why are you feeling down? Maybe something that I looked at, maybe something that I've done. Right? Like, we go into the effects of sins in the heart. I think we'll be here till tomorrow. So, uh, um, so at the end of the day, brothers, and I'll conclude with this, inshallah ta'ala, on this particular point. If you want a pure clean heart and take this advice of Ibn Al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi when he said Man arada safa'a qalbihi fal ala whoever wants a pure clean heart then let him make it a habit to always put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before his desires and temptations it gets tempting your friends are calling you the phone is calling you the filth and the evil is calling you and you step on your ego or you step on your Whatever they call it, right? You bite your mm. tongue, right? And look how you feel after that. This is one of the greatest mechanisms to really purifying your heart. Put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Okay. See how you feel after that. So, um, so I got a question for you, Ustad. Yeah. So let's say we're speaking to an individual that understands this, but they're in it too deep. So I know you're talking about every time you look at haram, you know? Every time you look at shouldn't be looking at there's a black card and then it's a big book before you know it. It's gonna, we, don't want any, we, we, we don't want anyone listening to think what we're saying is when you look at that immediately it's in a no but what we're saying is every single step is something that basically numbs you to the reality that you're headed towards I mean I think your audio is going sometimes it's good and then sometimes it's just because oh, could, could you hear me now? yeah now it's excellent yeah okay alhamdulillah so my main question is, what do you say to those people? What do you advise those brothers and sisters that are in it too deep where they don't even have the willpower to like basically abstain? So, for example, a brother that's desensitized to looking at what he shouldn't be looking at, maybe he does it multiple times a day. So what advice would you have for this brother? Because for him, it's like an addiction at that point. Hey, wonderful. Right? And what I'm about to say, brothers and sisters who are listening, Right, has worked for a lot of people. Right, and these are practical steps that I advise every single one of you guys to take. The first thing, brothers and sisters, Ibn Al Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says, "Wamin anfa'il adwiya addu'a." From the greatest of cures and most effective is a du'a. To make du'a sincerely to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Right, and sometimes we look at the Concept of a du'a, wallahi, I'll see, you know, I tried, didn't. Huh? From the bottom of your heart, while you are in sujood, right? While you are in sujood, you make that sincere du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the bottom of your heart. And this book, and I think I'll, you know, highlight it to the viewers. There is a book that was authored by Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, it's called The Sickness and the Cure. I honestly believe this Kitab here, this book here is the solution to a lot of the social issues 
that many youngsters are suffering from. Those who are addicted to pornography, those who are, you know, committing fahish and whatever have you. Mm. Aslan, this book was authored because of a letter that was sent to the imam. He himself was saying, I'm so indulged in sins. Right? And you gather, subhanAllah, the concern this individual has, this writer or this sender of this letter, of how much he's been trapped in these sins. And he's saying to Ibn Qayyim, if I don't find a solution out of this situation, this is not going to lead me to destruction. I remember when the Shaykh was teaching us in the Haram, in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Masjid, he was saying, it seems like this person has an addiction to something. Isn't this what many Shabab are suffering from today? Right? And then the Shaykh authored a whole book speaking about the effects of sins. One of the things that he mentioned in there was that from the greatest and most effective of cures is a dua. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, how often have I advised an individual with regards to this particular concept of a dua? You may see that it doesn't happen the first time, but I tell you, keep on going. Keep making dua, right? Keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep trying. And now I come on to the second point. Every single time that you commit that sin, stand up, make wudu, pray two rakaat. Pray two units of prayers. And in that sujood, you're making dua as well because the closest that you draw to Allah is where? In your prostration position, in the sujood. And it's only a matter of time. If Allah Azza wa Jal sees that goodness in your heart, He'll give it to you. Right? It may not necessarily happen the first time or the second time. You may go back into that sin. And I don't care how many times you fall back into that sin. I don't care what you are doing. Sometimes the shaitan comes and whispers and makes you feel hypocritical. Right? How can you be praying when you're committing zina? How can you be praying when uh, you're moving drugs from A to B? Right? How could you? See how he tries to trap you? Tries to make you feel that you're you know, being hypocritical? This is a trap from the shaitan. Wallahi, I don't care if you're a prostitute. And you're indulged in this sin. Keep returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that sujood, make dua to Allah azza wa jal. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, help me overcome this sin. See what happens. Allah azza wa jal has promised this in the Quran. If Allah sees that good in your heart, he'll give you that goodness that you're looking for. I'll tell you guys about a brother that I came to know about, right? And uh, he went on Umrah with us. You know, our brother, Imran ibn Mansur, he has these, uh, I think you guys know him, right? Uh, yeah, Dawah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. He has this amazing project where he takes brothers on the road, brothers on the streets, right, to Umrah. Some of the biggest drug dealers, they will come on Umrah and you'll see them doing 180s, changing their lives around. I, I'm a Hajj and Umrah operator. My dad sometimes takes people and I go with so many different um, Umrah groups. However, that Umrah group is something else. My Iman goes up when I'm around these kind of brothers. Brothers who are on the road who are really, you know, their utmost best trying to change their lives around. We sit in the Kaaba and they cry their eyes out. I'm trying to change. Please help. It has an impact on my heart. It's a very different <laughs> setting and very different group of brothers, you know? So anyways, I remember, subhanAllah, that there was a brother... They say he was running the drug industry in, uh, in East London, right? Apparently he has two houses as well. Allahu alam whether that's true or not. In one of the most <laughs> expensive areas. Huh? The guy is filthy rich and he would even pay for some of the uh, brothers to go on Umrah, right? Imagine this guy is moving drugs from A to B. He realizes the time of the Salah, right? He stops the car, takes out his sajada. He's praying, Matt, and he starts praying on the road. Gets back into his car, and then he's moving the drugs. They say three, four non-Muslim brothers, right, became Muslim because of him. He must be doing something right. That's why he hasn't been caught by the police. We need to become Muslims as well. Huh? Subhanallah. And the brother is moving drugs from A to B. Ajib. And eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided this brother. And that's what Allah tells us in the Quran. Inna salata. Indeed, the salat 
it removes the filth and the evil from an individual's life. Right? That's why I say, I don't care if you're a prostitute. I don't care if you're a drug dealer. Don't leave off the salah. Right? It is the trap from the shaitan for him to, you know, tell you, listen, this is hypocritical. You shouldn't be even praying, coming anywhere near the salah. I say to you, go and pray. And see what happens. You will see that that filth, inshallah ta'ala, will be removed. You know? Yeah. SubhanAllah. And, and this shows why Tazkiyah is so important because that's exactly what Tazkiyah does. And I can't wait to get to that part. Uh, once you go through the rest of the trace for have value, you know, men, women, or people in general. But I do want to take this moment to kind of emphasize this point because to make it really simple, I think a lot of people are going to struggle with this point because as Fahd was saying, they're in too deep. And what that looks like is they don't have a desire to want to leave these things because they have a desire for these things. And it's kind of like, if you take anything that you are interested in, a video game or a show or whatever, and you're sitting and you're not really in the mood to play or to watch, if you start thinking about the high points of the show and the high points of the game, you will suddenly feel a desire to go watch it or play it. Same thing with like men or women. If you are really... Uh, you know, not in a really, especially for men, if you're not in that kind of mood, as soon as you start thinking about things, you will put yourself in that mood. And it's the same exact thing when you're turning to Allah. If you're not thinking about Allah, if you're not reflecting on these things, you're still in that state of not wanting to. And it's uncomfortable to think about being in that state because right now you're in such a state that's so far. But as soon as you do it, as soon as you start thinking about Allah, as soon as you start reflecting, as soon as you read even a few ayat from the Quran, you will feel that change internally. And that is when you will desire to turn to Allah. You wonder, you know, how do people wake up you know, and go pray Fajr in, in the masjid at you know, early in the morning, 4 a.m., 5 a.m.? How do they even want to do that? It's because they're in a completely different state. And that's not to say that they're better. And this is something that I learned. Alhamdulillah, thank, I thank Allah every day for this. That I... I learned this when I was younger. I wasn't practicing. I went to a Catholic school. I was 16 years old and I came across one video on YouTube about Iblis. And that's how I kind of, you know, got back into Islam again. I heard the, the stories of Yusuf alayhi salam when I was a kid, but it didn't do anything for me or to me. And then when I, I saw this video about Iblis, I was just so interested in these concepts Islamically. Everything in my life, everything I watched, everything, even like my conversations with people was always about Islam. Alhamdulillah, Allah at that time, he made that exactly who I was. I was on a school bus, on, going on a field trip, debating people about Christianity and Islam on the bus, you know, the age of Aisha and like all these things. And that was, you know, what my life was. And honestly, a part of me misses those days because there was nothing else I was really interested in or worried about. And that's not because, oh, I was so great as a 16 year old. It's because that was all that surrounded me. And as a product of my surrounding my life was just, you know, da'wah, Islam, you know, being good to people, trying to call people to Islam and all these things. MashaAllah. Allah Mubarak, bro. Yeah. So it's not about me. The point, the point. No, no, that's deep, bro. Change your surroundings, inshallah, and you'll yeah. become a better person. InshaAllah. Without a shadow of a doubt, surroundings plays a huge role. Also, you know the guy who killed 99? I'm sure you guys have heard of the story. He killed 99 and then he went to uh, seek guidance, right? And he looked for the one who was the most knowledgeable on the face of this earth. And he was directed to a monk who was actually ignorant. So he asked him, is there a possibility for me to be forgiven? He said, no, he ended up killing him as well. Made a hundred clean, right? Uh, and then subhanAllah, when he was directed and steered towards a knowledgeable individual, he told him to leave them lands, right? He told them to leave the lands. And it may well be that an individual is in need of changing his surroundings by leaving wherever he is. I, I remember my situation, subhanAllah, and I've been mentioning this in some of the lectures that I've done. If my parents did not move me out of London, one of three things would have probably happened in Allah Azza wa I would either be dead or I would have joined ISIS or you would have found me in prison by now. Many of those around me, they ended up falling into, well, finding themselves in one of these three situations. My parents, they moved me out and went to a city called Leicester City. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes when I think back at this hadith, I see the effect of that. Like we had some brothers. I remember this Umrah, this last Umrah that we went on. I had a brother saying to me, you can't leave the house 
accept that he's holding a machete. He's carrying knives with him. He can't leave the house because of what maybe the people in the arrows are going to do to him. Like this kind of individual, is there any other option for him except to leave that area? He has to move out and Allah Azza wa Jalla will open doors. You leave something for the sake of Allah, he'll give you that which is better. Right? Hmm. Subhanallah. Actually, Shaykh, you reminded me of some ayats in the Quran and I'm going to paraphrase this. So please, you know, correct me if I, if I misspeak at all. But I believe there's ayat in the Quran that talk about on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish a group of people putting themselves into fitna. And there's also, I believe, ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked, you know, people, these similar people, at least people who li lived in lands of like, you know, fitna and fashia and all this stuff. It will be asked to them, you know, was Allah's earth not spacious enough for you to migrate? Showing that if you are in these situations, not only should you, but you need to. And if you don't, then that will be maybe a, a source of reckoning for you on the day of judgment. Yeah, without shut up, but yet, then blessings are in Surah Nisa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about hijrah. And then to the earth of Allah, was in the earth spacious enough for you to migrate? Especially if that place that you're in or them surroundings keep dragging you back. You have to learn to say no to those around you. Right? If we don't learn to say no, brothers and sisters, we will keep on being dragged to whatever direction it might be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. It's a lot to take in, man. Yeah. We all get a lot of gems. Reflective state when yeah. we're doing a podcast with someone with, with knowledge, mashallah. We all get into this reflective state where we just want to sit and listen. And we forget we're recording. We have to ask. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's why I said. That's why I said before we started. I was like, man, I feel like I'm just like sitting down. I'm about to get some knowledge. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's an honor. May Allah bless you. But uh, if if that's all, we can carry on. If there's other any other last minute like practical tips or you know things in the list that you want to add, what makes yeah. a man high value? Another important characteristic of a high value man is al ghayra right mm. having that protective jealousy well is reaching a point my beloved brothers and sisters right that <clears throat> one actually takes pride in showing his wife off Stop wanting me. everybody to see her like what's happening to us men i mean i believe it was Sheikh al-bani who said when the uh, jealousy of men died or when the jealousy died within men modesty died within women Right? Yeah. That's very, very profound. Is it true? Without a shadow of a doubt. Us men have forgotten how to be men. We're too worried about what others are going to say about us and what society has become. Right? We're seen as misogynists. This is a term that's thrown around. The moment you say anything that moves the feminist bone, right? The moment you say something that moves that feminist bone, you are, right, jammed with these terms of, oh, you're a misogynist and you're overly protective and um, you're controlling. controlling yeah. right? How was the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How were the companions? Mm. SubhanAllah, let me share with you guys a hadith. One time the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm just paraphrasing here for the sake of time. Otherwise, I normally would mention it in Arabic. The Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrated that he once saw himself in a jannah while in a dream, right? He was having a dream and then he found himself in a jannah. And then he saw that there was a woman that was making wudu in a palace. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, who does this belong to? This palace and this woman who's doing wudu. It was said to him, it is Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when it occurred to him that he wanted to enter this palace, and then he remembered the protective jealousy of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is while he's in the dream. How can I go into a palace when there's a woman there and she's for Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala Right? So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, I refrained and I just left. I went the opposite direction. Look at the understanding between, you know, the men of that time, subhanAllah. Allah, I, 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 not so long ago, and, and I'm so grateful to Allah as well, this video, this lecture that I gave, picked up a lot of publicity. It's called Cheating Husbands, Filthy Fathers, and Freemixing. I don't know if you guys came across it. 
right? In that lecture, because you know, it's one thing quoting all the hadith and ayat and which is then going to fall on deaf ears to many. Oh, look at this guy. You know, he's just backwards, out of touch with reality. We're living in the 21st century, right? Men and women, they have to be mixing with one another. And why are you being overprotective for? Why are you being controlling? Habibi, it's not necessarily about me being overprotective or as they say, insecure, right? This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. So in that lecture, I read out, right? The people, the yani victims, these are victims who fell victim to gender mixing. What ended up happening to their marriages? How the marriages broke down? How some of them became traumatized? And that is because simply you did not follow a basic instruction, which was not being alone with the opposite gender. Messenger said, Never does a man seclude himself with a woman except that the third is shaitan. You've been told also, Beware of entering upon women. So the Messenger was asked about the brother in law. The Messenger said, The brother in law is death. The brother in law is death. And he is the closest to his brother's wife. You're being told that he is death, let alone anyone else. So, subhanAllah, some of these victims, they would say we would open our doors for mm. innocent chit chats where men would come in with their wives. And then, subhanAllah, zina ends up taking place in mm. the house of the woman that opened these doors for people to come and gender mix. This is when I, wallahi, really appreciate knowledge, honestly. I, the other day, I came across I mean, this video, and the video is going viral on Twitter. Right? A, uh, a, a man's getting married to a woman. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It was literally kicking off. man's getting married to a woman, and she requested from him to bring this popular celebrity guy or something. Everybody yeah, her, her favorite artist. Favorite artist. So he comes and hugs her in front of everyone, and she's getting excited. On the wedding day, and he's there, apparently. Uh, he's there apparently. I don't know whether he was clapping his hands and no one oppressed him. Uh, but from what people were saying, oh, this guy is watching, enjoying his wife being hugged by her favorite artist. So my question to you is, where do you think this cock fetish started at? Like, where do you think this, this came from? Because it's, I don't want to say it's a new thing because I've even grown up. I'm, I'm, I was born in the 90s, but even growing up, we've seen that every now and then. Some guys were like that, but there's an overwhelming amount of men. Majority of modern men living in the West today are like that. They're the youth. Where do you think this come from? Yeah, so you use the term the youth, which basically means he's somebody that allows evil to take place with his women folk. Mm -hmm. with last second, uh, yeah, no worries. Just fix yeah. that. You play this back thing. Yeah. It's one of those uh, sensitive lights. Like somebody who you know doesn't have a problem with you hugging his wife or hugging his sister, doesn't have absolutely no issues whatsoever. I think we can maybe narrow it down to two reasons. The first reason is, right? You know, brothers, when the people stop speaking about that which the truth is, you will see the opposite taking a stronghold. Would you guys agree with that? When you look at the feminist movement, you find a feminist movement that ended up having such a stronghold. Now you have the Red Pill movement. Well, not everything that they say is actually wrong. They are coming out with some things that are correct, right? However, a lot that which they propagate, to be honest, isn't in line. With the Sharia, in fact, it is contrary to it. So you have a type of batil, a type of falsehood that is pretty widespread, and then because the truth is then not spoken about, everyone is now scared to be cancelled. You see some other nonsense that is going to come out to counter that. Do you guys agree with that? One hundred percent. This has happened in ancient times as well. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at the whole LGBTQ movement, that's actually become my favorite topic over the last month or so, right? Wherever I go, I speak about it, right? It is reaching a point, brothers and sisters, that one feels embarrassed. He feels embarrassed to say his gender. He's asked about, oh, what, what is your gender? Are you straight? Are you not? The guy thinks thrice of what he should say. He's absolutely petrified to speak about his gender. 
how, how has it come to that? Well, he's thinking to himself, oh, what's the agenda? Am I going to get cancelled? Uh, this, that. Nobody knows what they can actually say. Right? People don't even know what they can actually say. People don't even know that I could actually hold on to my morals and my values and I can be vocal about it. Many don't know. And that's, I put that down to the truth not be propagated. And because of that, you will see the opposite hmm. uh, taking a stronghold. Even Subhanahu ibn Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentioned, فَإِذَا قَوِيَةِ الْبِدْعَةِ Or the opposite, in fact. فَإِذَا ضَعُفَةِ السُنَّةِ قَوِيَةِ الْبِدْعَةِ When the sunnah becomes weak, the bid'ah, the opposite of that, the innovations, they will start becoming what? Stronger. And we can say that about anything. He is speaking about the sunnah and the bid'ah. I could be what? Watering down the truth. And I heard, subhanAllah, this is exactly what happened in America. You had some of the leading figures coming out saying that, oh, uh, we agree with same-sex marriages, uh, mother. Uh, and uh, we, we agree with same-sex marriages politically, but we disagree with it morally. Hmm. You have people listening to this. What do you want them to take away from this? Hmm. Well, like some of the Americans, you know, they, they, they say to me, You'll walk through a university campus and you'll struggle to find a hijabi who's not wearing LGBTQ rainbow colors on her chest. You will struggle to find it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Can we put it down to there not being enough people to propagate that which is the truth, according to that which is right? Not being firm with their positions. You will see the opposite taking a stronghold. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And also, subhanAllah, you know, the fact that there was a lot of these fear-monging tactics that were used. Anybody who uses certain terms, mm. feminists will come out on him and completely annihilate him. And to some degree, you know, that guy, A.T., Dr. Abu Taymiyyah, he put them in their place, right? He actually completely shut them down. And of course, not everything uh, that he says is actually wrong. There were some things that he said which were... You know, in line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sharia. But to some degree, he actually really did put them in their place. But up until then, right, you had people who were extremely scared of being called misogynist and, you know, mm. against women and, and, uh, and whatever have you. And you see my point? So these fear-monging tactics that were being used, these jamming tactics of being labeled bigots and whatever have yeah. you. It really put fear in a lot of people's hearts, you know, to say anything about that which is right. Yeah, one of our teachers, brother uh, Gabriel Romani, he, he often told us that it's, you know, the programming, the conditioning, it's always going to be there. You know, uh, the shaming tactic, calling us oppressive, controlling, barbaric, it's always going to be there. But it's when we, as ambassadors of Islam, let go of the upper hand, and when we started bending down, that's when it and you're blurring out again. Is that happening for you guys as well, Rami and Angel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sounds like your mic is underwater sometimes. Really? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's a connection let issue me, or... Let me, let me try that one more time. Hold up. I think it's just how you're speaking into it because when you put your face up like that, it goes back to... Oh. Rami, you need to give me uh, the link for that mic. Huh? Is it clear now? <laughs> <laughs> we have the same mic, <laughs> Sheikh. Maybe, maybe it's uh, it's the gain. Maybe, maybe could be. But oh, Sheikh, no, bro, what's on your mind? Oh, we're back to recording time. My bad. Have you know? You know what's funny, right? You know what's funny? I did some research on how all of this LGBTQ stuff uh, started picking up in the 1980s. Two Harvard graduates, they use this three-step strategy in order to really push this narrative. You know what this three-step strategy was? Number one, desensitize. You speak about an issue so much that people become so desensitized to it. Khalas, okay, we've got the point now. Because they keep hearing it. If I stand on the pulpit and I'm propagating the exact same thing week in, week out, even if you don't agree with me the first week, after week number five, you subconsciously have accepted what I'm saying. Step number two, using these jamming tactics to label anyone who comes with a descendant opinion that he's this and he's that. Fear-mongering tactics. Does that make sense? 
they will start using these jamming tactics to label you bigots, to label you uh, a homophobe, and you're this and you're that, and and then خلاص, you will be silenced. Number three, once that happens, brothers and sisters, convert. They will easily convert you. I think it was you guys, right? I think it was you guys. You guys done a reaction video on that. Uh, will convert your children, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. I remember I came across that and I sent it to so many different people. I mean, not this, uh, not you guys' reaction, but I think I may have searched it and then I came across you guys reacting on it. Mm -hmm. Like, alhamdulillah, at least some brothers are bringing this to light. <laughs> right? We got so much hate for that, I remember. And what worse, it's from the Muslims. They're probably American Muslims. Mm -hmm. Sorry to say this, right? Fine in America, here in the UK, we're a lot more conservatives and nothing against the Americans. Mm -hmm. huh? In America, well, I had the average Muslim will say to you, leave them alone. We are both minority. We need one another. They are made to feel that they have to either be on the back foot or they must have these coalitions with them. Alhamdulillah, and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal. This doesn't happen to us in the UK. Here in the UK, we're a lot more conservative. And this is why I'm going to every masjid. I could be speaking about bunny rabbits and rainbows and this topic comes in. We'll make mention of it. Masjid doesn't want to call me back again, no problem. Alhamdulillah. So far, 110% record of always being what? Called back to that same masjid. Hmm. Even the masjid are beginning to realize this is something that must be spoken about. Right? Excuse me, I'm not raising my voice to anybody here or anyone else. But I just get extremely passionate about this particular topic. And I just feel like not enough is being said. Not enough people are coming out. I think about it. How is it that this minority group, the LGBTQ movement, are so loud when in reality they are what a raindrop compared to anyone else? They are a raindrop in the sea. Because every single one of them is playing a part. You see them using these hashtags. They come out. They are vocal about what they stand for. And I just want to make it extremely clear, right? That we are not here to entice harassment or violence towards any minority group. We are just quoting and we are just what's stating that which is happening on the ground. Every single one of them is playing a part, brothers and sisters, being vocal about what they stand for. But when it comes to us, we're being made to feel that we must be silent. No, you don't have to be silent. This position that Islam has when it comes to LGBTQ, right, is not just something that is exclusive to Muslims. This is also the view of the Christians. The other day I was quoting in a lecture how Torah Jews, I think it was over 300 rabbis, they came together and they unanimously agreed that this is something that is immoral. And I'm just quoting now. Hmm. This is something that is immoral and harmful. They refer to themselves as Torah Jews. So this is not something that is just like, you know, uh, exclusive to Muslims. We have to really play our part. It's sad. This is the reality, right? It's sad. That's, you know, young men are taking uh, Andrew Tate as role models. I can put it down to not enough men, not enough scholars coming out and teaching the people how to be men. So when somebody like this comes out, they feel the need. Okay, you know what? I never had a father to teach me. I didn't find anyone ever teaching me how to be a real man. Let me turn to an individual like this. Hmm. Right? So, yani, every single one of us like, has a role to play in establishing the truth. Stop being scared, my brothers and my sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you. Look what Ibn Al-Qaim mentioned. mentioned. Siding with Allah Azza wa Jalla's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't say as a burden, even if you are by yourself. And that is because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will be with you. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will be with you. Brothers, let me ask you guys, right? When you guys came out and spoke about this song that was going viral, did you think that this had a negative effect on whatever you guys are trying to push onto the public? Nope. Well, Matter of fact, I think I think it had a positive effect. Yeah, yeah, nothing, no effect. Hmm. Did your YouTube channel get closed down? Huh? Did hmm. every single one of you guys get cancelled? Halas, these guys have been ex. You can't travel. You've been imprisoned inside of your homes. Is no, but matter. Happened? You know, you know what we actually did get. We got a lot of people, and especially Christians too, 
saying you guys said what we were too scared to say. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. No, no. Allah khair. Allah khair. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be by your side. Because you're doing that which many people are not doing. And that is standing up for the truth. And that's something that you guys are commended for. So anyways, going back to the whole ghayra issue, and I think this is extremely important. Having that protective jealousy isn't necessarily something that makes you insecure. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us to be. To be individuals who have ghayra. If that protective jealousy dies within you, brothers, you will see filth and evil taking over you. As Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned. And then he says, Whoever doesn't have protective jealousy, he doesn't have religion. You will see his religion deteriorating. And his heart will die. And then eventually you will see, right, his actions following suit. You know how you need body temperature, right? You need warmth inside of your body. Otherwise you'll die as a human being. He's saying that ghayra, that protective jealousy, is no different to that. That harara, that warmth that you need inside of your body, the ghayra is similar to that. You must have that. Otherwise your heart will die. Subhanallah. Out of all the things that he could have mentioned that keeps your life, he's talking about the ghayra like that. Talking about the protective jealousy like that. Hmm? You know what's crazy? Hmm. Is that every man has his, like whether the Muslim or not, it's kind of like instilled in us. Because even when I wasn't Muslim, I, I could feel that. And then when a woman, so, not submits, but when one uh, suppresses this, Right, because you live in a society where it's told like, oh, you shouldn't be jealous. You know, you should let your should let your woman do what she wants. Like, you should give her the freedom and all this stuff. Is that when one suppresses this, it, it, it the mental chaos that goes on inside of you, like you start feeling like less of an individual. And imagine like you keep doing this more and more until now this becomes normal for you. And then now you've just kind of like submitted yourself to it. And then now, because you can't stand for that, because you can't even express yourself, because you can't even be truthful, well, now this woman's walking over you. Now she doesn't see you the same way. Now uh, someone else is walking over you. And then it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps repeating itself. So I just, I think it's crazy, man. Well, it's also, subhanAllah, I used to say this back in 2015, when I would discourage the youth, right, from taking these... Uh, rap stars and these celebrities as role models mm. right i think it was kanye west that really got the ball rolling showing off his wife everybody's trying to be like kanye west oh come and look at my wife okay subhanallah that which is precious have you guys ever thought about this point like this right have you noticed that whatever is precious whatever is precious is actually really hard to get to mm. diamonds Gems, pearls, do you agree that it's very hard to get to even your bank card? Is it easy for a pickpocket to just come and swipe your bank card because you're going to try and hide it, right? Everything that is precious, brothers, is very hard to get to. Aren't our women precious? Why is it that we're flashing them around? You wouldn't do that to your bank card. You wouldn't do that to your money that you keep hidden in a safe. Why are you flashing your woman around like that for? Right? Where has your protective jealousy gone? Right? And this is, I honestly believe, something that needs to be revived, something that needs to be brought back to life. It's not being overprotective. It's just her knowing her place and you doing your role of protecting your women folk. It's as simple as that. And remember, we are governed by a sharia. We are governed by a sharia. The morals of the people are changing as time goes on. Hmm. I remember when I was going to Australia, there was a stopover at uh, New Delhi, right? And there was this Irish guy who just, you know, decided to come and sit next to me. He was on the same flight as me. And I was like, where are you going? He was like, I'm going to Australia. By yourself? He goes, yeah. Because I was meant to be with my girlfriend, right? However, me and her broke up. I was like, why? What, what happened? So we just, you know, I thought maybe this is an opportunity now to bring him closer to Islam. And he was like, I saw, I, I caught her sending images to any, all of these other guys, you know, you know? So, uh, and then she was like to me that I'm being overprotective. I was just sending a picture of me. 
where do you draw the line? When you're not governed by Sharia, when you don't have morals that are divine, right? You have things that were, you know, considered immoral maybe 20 years ago. All of a sudden now they're considered what? Perfectly moral. So I said, where do you draw the line? You allow your girlfriend to maybe dress a certain way. What happens tomorrow if she decides to walk on the streets without barely wearing anything? She decides to walk with... Uh, excuse me for even mentioning this. Like She's barely wearing anything. She's wearing a bikini, for example. Where do you draw the line? Right? You allow her to speak to other men. You don't have a problem with that. But the moment she sends a picture, you've got a problem with that. Where do you draw the line? Mm. Who determines what are considered good morals and bad morals even like when you speak to the atheists right the atheists they themselves can't agree on that what is considered morally acceptable and what is not طيب, you guys are differing with one another someone may you know you know wake up tomorrow and say okay me killing you is something that is perfectly moral where do you draw the line this is why we have no option except to accept that there is an external entity i.e allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has governed us with the Sharia, who instruct us to keep certain morals and certain things need to be what removed from your life. Otherwise, whatever relationship you enter into, you will always have these disputes if you don't have the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the companions, right, that you keep going back to. Every other day you're arguing with her, why are you dressing like that? Why are you wearing this? Why are you not doing this? Why stop being overprotective? No, our Sharia is this, right? Sorry, brothers. I know we just kind of like went from one place. Allahi, to this was this was one of my favorite. No, this was one of my favorite podcasts we ever filmed because this was so beneficial. It's yeah. it's literally just like I was telling you the comments that we got once we made that video. I'm telling you these are the things that we want to say, but it's not that we're afraid to say. It, but sometimes we get too caught up in our head, like, oh, do other people think like this? Am I the only one? But the reality is, it's fitra, yeah, and good. Allah has given us a gift of unclouding that fitra. And the least that we could do is unite and show the world that we all think the same. It's not abnormal. It's not brainwashed or barbaric or anything like that. And we got to stand for haq. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So if anyone wants to cancel you guys, they can just cancel me, inshallah. I'll leave you guys alone. You guys can continue. Uh -huh. like Somebody come after me, inshallah. You guys are upon the fitrah. Huh? Guys, it, it sucks. It sucks. We got to wrap this up. But unfortunately, maybe we can do another one. But guys, smash that like button, 5,000 likes, and inshallah, we will meet up with Brother Abu Taymiyyah in person, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. Guys in Canada, imagine for the last six years, every year somebody says to me, we're going to swallow your trip to Canada. And I actually give my heart to it. That it's going to happen. And then every single year something happens. Every single year. Even now, after the Australian trip, I was meant to be going to Canada, and something happens, subhanAllah. Allah, if you guys are in Canada, hopefully next year some of the brothers will, you know, sort something out. Are you guys in Toronto or in Ottawa? Yeah, we're, we're near Toronto, bro. Hmm. Yeah. And inshallah, we, inshallah, not, we can... inshallah, we'll be going to the UK. Inshallah. My man, my man just revealed yeah. it just like that. Yes. Hi, <laughs> right, guys. If you made it this far, only you know. Um, inshallah, look forward to a UK tour coming up sometime, inshallah. Inshallah, Ya Rabb. Taib. And with that being said, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhaab al-nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.